Uh, next in. I'm Wes Nunley with Next Level, uh, and this is Next In, and I'm on today with James Huntsberg, uh, who's leading product at Rattle. James, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Wes? The intro after the intro, right? Because we were talking before this. Um, well, awesome, man. I would love to just kind of open this up. We can go any direction you want. Um, if you'd like to just introduce yourself, man, and just tell kind of who you are and what you're doing today at Rattle, and then we can just take it from there. Happy to. So I'm James Hunsberger, as Wes mentioned. I've been in the technology and B2B SaaS space for a little over 10, 12 years thereabout, and recently got a chance to move into product. So I've been spending most of my career designing and develop enterprise systems. Salesforce, NetSuite, Boomi, Wakado, the middleware, the phones that make up any of these business technology stacks, that's where I made my home. Recently, Rattle has decided that they are going to be building out an application that will connect these business applications to your messaging platforms. And they wanted someone with that deep industry knowledge that has been in the trenches, seeing how these software platforms develop, how they integrate, how they fit together. And they brought me on board to help lead the engineering efforts to make that happen. So I'm kind of new to it, but I'm happy to be here and happy to talk a little bit that I do know about product. Yeah, I think actually what led to us talking is I approached you about coming on the podcast and I said, hey, man, we interview product leaders and you're kind of like, whoa, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> talked about kind of getting into product in a really non-traditional way, which I actually think makes complete logical sense. And clearly um, the founders at Rattle do as well, right? To have someone that would have benefited greatly from the product that you're now leading come in and lead that product, right? I mean, is that, so can you kind of speak to like how you even got into product? Cause I know there are gonna be people that are gonna to listen to this that have looked at product, maybe that engineer that's like, I've been coding for a while and I'm over it. Like, how do I <laughs> jump over there, right? So if, if that hypothetical person who may be not so hypothetical is listening to this, um, how did you get into product, man? How, how, would, how did you make that leap? All right, very cool question. So first off, I'm not discounting the role Blind, stinking luck played in all of this. Um, so don't at me. Don't tell me that I got lucky. I know how lucky I got. But I'll give you the rundown about how I happen to get lucky. There's a lot of cross skills that go into good product management. And this is by benefit of some great mentors I've had, the ones that encouraged me that said, you're not getting out over your skis. You can do this. Give yourself a little bit of time to grow into it. But don't be afraid. So they said, first off, communication. You need to be able to dissect problems. You need to talk to different levels of folks in different levels of technical aptitude. Talk to sales, talk to customer right. success, talk to marketing, talk to engineers. The more people you can talk to, and probably more importantly, listen to how they're responding to you, the more you're going to be able to effectively tell someone, we need to get X, Y, or Z done. X, Y, or Z needs to happen for this person that they are asking for you know, a, a faster horse-drawn buggy, but we got to build them a car. And the opportunity to have years and years and years of working with operations folk, rev ops folk, marketing engineers, and listening to the problems that they ran into and becoming an advocate for both what my engineers can accomplish, but what my customers want to be able to do on their own has made me this really um, valuable middle representative kind of negotiating between these two parties, figuring out how we can get something done that is still meaningful, while at the same time not making my engineers' lives miserable. Again, new company, small product niche, so it's a little bit easier for me than someone who's trying to do this at Salesforce or Acta or one of those big boys, but it's been a really cool journey for me for the last couple months. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you know, to put it, at least for me, to put it in layman's terms, essentially what Rattle's doing is they're harmonizing enterprise systems where everything's easily accessible in like a Slack channel, right? Would that be a, a fair? That's the goal. You know, if we can, I have this 90 second rule is if you can get something done within 90 seconds, maybe even 60 seconds, you'll just do it to get it off your plate and clear that mind space. Just, I, I get to move on. I don't have to think about it anymore. And what I've seen with a lot of people who are interacting with enterprise systems, be it Salesforce, HubSpot, NetSuite, doesn't really matter. If you force them to do two or three hours of just admin work at the end of the week, it's pulling teeth. People are yeah. avoiding it. They're procrastinating against it. They're losing the context. So if we can say at the end of this sales call, you're going to get a notification to your Slack channel directly to you. You click a button. You, in 30 seconds, you can add your notes. You can update a status. And then you move on with your life. 
You focus on the selling. You focus on that next prospect call. You take a break for 30 seconds and just get your mind in the right space. We feel like that's a very powerful enablement tool for all of our individual contributors. And then we can use all of these interactions. The fact that five of your sales reps are doing this like no one's business and then two of them maybe aren't still jiving with the rest of the team. The managers, what we can do upstream from them the supervisors and everyone else that we can enable to say, these are the squeaky wheels, get some grease on them. It really has become a tool that enables all levels of the business to do their job more efficiently and with the correct time context. And that's really exciting for me as someone who spent years and years and years trying to force people to do something they didn't want to do. Yeah. Listen, man, I, uh, I come in, so, you know, I work a hybrid schedule. I'm home three days and here in our Nashville office, two days. And uh, about every Thursday, my, my CEO is breathing down my neck because my HubSpot is a mess. Like it's it's bad. It's really bad. Um, and I'll so I'm doing stuff. Don't fire yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, we you know I, I brought on. We're working with a new new account out in Seattle, and, and I brought them on. But there's no notes in HubSpot. You would think that they just appeared. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think what you're doing is incredible, man. And I would imagine that your experience, uh, at Boulevard, um, impacts the, the work you're doing today. I mean, would that be, it's probably a, an ob- obvious statement. Yeah. Oh, obvious. I mean, any, yeah. any experience you can get out there and I'm not certainly one to advocate for job hum- ho- um, hopping. It worked out well for me, but just understand that Every company that does business is going to have some things that are similar and some things that won't be. What you say about HubSpot, even though I don't know the individual notes you're trying to add, the qualification criteria you're saying, I can key in on a couple of these pain points and recognize, yes, we can help with that. We're not going to solve it. We can't right. you know, wave a magic wand and just uh, invent this perfect AI bot that'll do it for you. But we can make life better. We can make life easier. So when I think of Boulevard, And I think of the fact that we had these SDR teams, these AE teams, these onboarding teams, these success teams, all trying to work out of the same system. Things like just one field trigger cascading through the entire org saying this customer success manager needs to be aware that this deal has been upsold and now they're getting a different tier of um, customer support. So we need to respond to their tickets faster. We need to let the CFO know that, hey, there is an incoming change order. So our revenue recognition schedule needs to change and we need to prorate how the invoices are gonna be generated going forward. Then the accounting team can know that the invoice generation um, batch job needs to be updated. The fact that you can automate all of these from a couple of very minor trigger events and use the native elements of Salesforce to bring it into a collaborative space like Microsoft Teams, like Slack, and let these people know that they aren't blindsided when all of these notifications and everything start piling in. It just makes everyone feel involved in the process. And for better or worse, you know, it once people get used to that, it's become a really effective way to make sure everyone's on the same page and while I land heavily on my time at Boulevard, you know, my time as a consultant, my time at Acta and some of these larger enterprise orgs, they all orbited around similar problems and being able to flexibly dissect those problems and try and build something for them. It's, it's fun. Yeah, it is fun. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it's an efficiency tool, right? And who can't, well, it doesn't be more I efficient. Hope so. yeah. <laughs> I hope so. If I'm, if I'm making your life harder, I'm probably not going to keep my customers around too long. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, um, look, we, we're the we're the consumers of a few key products because they make us more efficient. They make our communication better. You know, um, to be honest with you, uh, I, I use LinkedIn Sales Navigator for one reason, not because I can't go find CTOs and CPOs on my own. I can. But if you use Sales Navigator, you can go into a company and it'll cascade their leadership right there for you all in one place. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of efficiency. So Jim, I, when you're not doing that, um, you, you have some interesting hobbies. Um, do you want to, do you want to tell everyone what Tenkara fishing is? Oh, well, sure. Um, so Tenkara fishing, uh, first off, I'm, I'm in Denver, I'm in Colorado and I'm a Texas transplant. So for a number of years, I was fishing big water off the coast, um, down in Mustang Island, that area. And I had never done fly fishing. So when I come up to Colorado and, you know, any oceans nearby, it was time to kind of change the game up a little bit. So 
I, I've got a couple kids. I don't have the time to, you know, drive three hours in the mountains, fish for eight hours, and then come back late that night. It's just not going to fly with my kids or my wife. So the little streams that are nearer to Denver that I can get to in an hour or two, that's the way to go. So Tenkara fishing. It's an old school Japanese method where you've just got this telescope and rod. It goes anywhere from generally eight feet to 12 feet. And it's a fixed line. So when you think of most fishing, you've got the rod, you've got the reel, and you're cranking in your lure, your worm, whatever you're throwing out there. Tenkara, you've just got a fixed line. So you don't have any reel to worry about. You cast into these kind of smaller creeks. You're looking for smaller fish. You've got a lighter weight rod. So even an eight or 10 yeah. incher will feel like you're fighting a redfish. And it's a nice way for me to always be able to dip a line in whenever I'm out with the kids and maybe a nice little park that has a creek running through it without necessarily uh, totally losing touch with uh, what I had as a hobby as a younger man. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you, you talk about uh, taking off uh, to fish for, for eight hours and the kids not being okay with it, man, my wife is the one that would. <laughs> well, like, I mean, the kids would probably be okay. Let's just yeah. be real. Uh, once they're a little bit older and I get a chance to indoctrinate them into all these hobbies, yeah, I've right. got my four-year-old is going to be put on skis this winter and I cannot wait to see how that goes. That's awesome. going to be fun times. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm a 32-year-old who's never been on skis, so I think you're – yeah, that's awesome. Hey, I, I was 29 before I ever stepped onto a snowboard, and in Texas, there's not a lot of opportunities for yeah. that. So it's coming to Colorado, so it's never too late. But I do have this theory. I might be able to roundabout take this back to product. Maybe not. We'll see. There's this concept I have of um, seven-year-old brain. I learned how to ride a bike when I was seven years old. And I never really got great at it. I was riding pavement. You know, I might go off a little six inch jump with my friends, but I come to Colorado and I get on a mountain bike and I think, yeah, of course I can do a mountain bike. And I, I have no fear center of my brain. It's just like, oh, this is a totally blind drop off. I could be going five feet down or 50 feet down. Just send it, you're good. Whereas right. I didn't learn snowboarding until I was much, much older, 29 years old. So I have got much better at snowboarding than I possibly could at mountain biking, mountain biking much more likely to kill me, much more likely to seriously injure me, and yes. I'm not as good at it. But because I've got that seven-year-old brain rattling around in the back of my head, I'm more likely to do something dumb and just full send it. Okay, now to tie this all back into product. I didn't get into product until I had seen some bad engineering, uh, some projects go sideways on engineering teams, both large and small companies. So the caution that experience gave me uh, after spending 10, 15 years doing operations, doing business support, seeing how much companies were hesitant to move away from manual processes, because even if they were slow, manual meant accuracy. Manual meant people right. were looking at it and thinking about it and doing it right. So that's what I want to say about these aspiring project managers and product managers is that attention to detail and that experience to know like, Yes, sometimes you got to go all gas and just get something out the door. But when you start getting a little gray in your hair, when you start being the old man on some of these product teams, knowing when to tap the brakes, knowing when to be a little bit cautious and not go blind over that hill and maybe take one or two more customer interviews before you ship something. If that little voice yeah. in the back of your head is saying, tap the brakes, slow down a little bit, check your six, listen to that voice. And I, I feel like I tied that together pretty nicely. Yeah, nice. You brought it back. You brought it back. So uh, <laughs> since you brought it back, what what is your favorite aspect of product management? All right. So the favorite aspect is for the first time in a couple years, I'm back to a true learner's mindset. For a long time, I was leading teams. I was the expert. I was the one that if an admin gave me an estimate how long it would take to something, I had done that thing a dozen times and I knew exactly how long it should take. I could gauge where this person was at. I was, I hate using this term, the smartest guy in the room because there's often only two or three of us in the room. So it's kind of a low bar. Now that I'm back in product, I'm working with full stack engineers. I'm working with product marketing managers. I am working with front end developers, back end developers, learning that I am just absolute garbage at using Figma. It is this um, almost, uh, this need for me to go back and relearn all of yeah. these skills but I'm doing so with this um, mindset of someone who's already been out there and has some battle scars. And that makes me that much more willing to accept a lesson that I might have ignored maybe as a younger man. So I'm hoping that I'm getting better with uh, age and uh, haven't lost yeah. my edge too much. But so far, the part I love about product is the fact that it's challenging me in a way that I had kind of 
maybe lost my North star on because I had gotten so senior with the previous roles I had taken. Yeah, no, and I, I can second that hundred percent. I actually left um, my previous organization to come here to next level for that. Like I got to a point where I was earning, I was earning a comfortable income. They were, you know, they're treating me well and everything was good, but like too good. Right. Like I'm not being challenged. I'm not growing, I'm not learning. And man, I, I think, you know, to your point, the way that you stay in front, out in front intellectually uh, is by constantly is by constantly growing and learning. Um, I'll tell you right now, if I'm ever the smartest person in a room, I need to find another room. <laughs> Not a good room to be in. Um, so, yeah, I, I love that. So what, what are you doing personally to, to grow in the role you're in um, to kind of get up to speed and, oh, and to just kind of take it and run with it? Like first 90 day kind of personal yeah. strategy. So. The benefit of this long experience, and while I did kind of um, say I'm not encouraging anyone to job hop, uh, that network that you build when you see a couple of different organizations. Oh. I've been extremely lucky, coming back to this lucky standpoint again, where I've connected with a number of great product folks that are now VPs, SVPs, senior folks in product that are working in all different sizes of boards. So the first thing I did is I worked that network hard. People yeah. I was not reporting to and totally unashamed to be really dumb in front of. So called up everyone who couldn't uh, fire me for incompetence and said, I need help. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, I love that. So, I love <laughs> There's a key caveat uh, of yeah. who you're saying this to. <laughs> exactly. The, the level of ignorance you admit to uh, should be somehow correlated to uh, the likelihood of you getting fired for admitting that ignorance. So that was step one. Make sure that I was in a safe space and had the opportunity to tell my dog to be a bit quiet and also to talk to plenty of folks that would be totally willing to, um, you know, pat me on the head, said, yep, nice try. Here's how you do it. Right. Right. After that, I was real um, uh, careful when I selected this role that they first off knew that product was something that I had some transferable skills in, but wasn't something I had deep experience. So they were totally willing to send me to, um, for lack of a better word, a product boot camp. I don't know if you're familiar with the product school um, program, but they were able to send me there and get me introduced to, it's a, it's a, in my opinion, I'm in no way uh, getting kickbacks for product school admissions. But this is a, not a sponsored podcast. No, sir. So it was, uh, I think it was about a three month program and they have several tiers of this. They have kind of the entry level product management and they have some more leadership and executive focused ones. But what I really loved about it was um, they introduced you to a bunch of the standard tools that you'll see across the industry. So it got me to a baseline competency around um, some of these methods, some of these co common terminologies. You know, every one of these technical roles has its own lexicon of abbreviations and right. jargon and legalese. So having um, a soft introduction to all of that um, and getting it done quickly and out of the way, very helpful. So I talked to people that I could trust to not laugh at me too much. And if they were yeah. laughing at me, they were good natured about it. I got teaching. And I was fortunate enough to have someone that was willing to pay for my teaching, but um, there was also, even if they weren't able to, I would have funded out of my own pocket because I'm here to learn. And third was the self-serve um, uh, reading, blogging, everything. There's so many great resources out there that cost, you know, the basically the trip to a library card or a subscription to a newsletter on LinkedIn. And these great content producers, these great authors out there um, you know, I, I don't read the way I used to uh, with the kiddos. It's just not on the table anymore, but I'm slowly churning my way through some books, reading some weekly newsletters, and wherever there's a bit of knowledge to be gleaned, I'm happy to take it on. Yeah. What, what, books, what books do you have on that list? So the first one that really impacted me was called The Build Trap, I believe. And it's basically helping you transition from a very reactionary, like, the illusion, or maybe not illusion, but the um, endorphin rush you get from producing something and making something and building something. It, it's very addictive to get trapped into, well, I'm building, I'm building, I'm building, I'm doing stuff, things are happening. And that's good for a lot of companies, especially for startups. But it also, as the book title suggests, traps you in a certain mindset that prevents you from maybe looking strategically or digging into something. It, it's almost like the um, delusion where if I get off the highway and take an extra 60 miles on backcountry roads, I won't be sitting still. You may still get there later, but you right. have that illusion of progress. And that's right. one of the things I've struggled with is that like, oh, I'm all on the gas, but 
my tires are spinning in sand, you know, ease up off the gas, rock it a little bit, get moving forward. Um, and just understand that the mere act of uh, going a million miles an hour will be rewarding emotionally, but maybe not the best way to be spending your time and may burn you out. So build trap was a great one for me. Um, product led um, Lenny, uh, there's Lenny's podcast or Lenny's newsletter. Um, I forget uh, the exact name of it, but he produces weekly content that I find really helpful for this product led growth new um, area. So very recently we launched our own freemium product, a rattle for startups, if you will. And the idea being that we give them a taste of our product. um, And if that's all you need, that's all you need, but it gives us an opportunity to orient the conversation towards the value that rattle can provide to an org. We get to spell out some use cases, help them expand. And when they're ready, we upsell them. So product led growth and any of the leaders, Lenny being the one I go to most often is there. And I'll give a quick plug to one of my favorite mentors, Adam Weinstein. So he and I work together at Boulevard and he's recently started producing his own newsletter. And that's one where I've had a couple of, um, the way he writes about how you accept equity and evaluate job prospects and where in your career you're at, what type of roles you want to gamble on and when you want to maybe uh, take a little bit more of a conservative route. Those are some ones that I personally um, had some great success with, but I'm also happy to listen to podcasts like this and find the ones I haven't discovered yet. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That's good. Uh, You know, since we're doing this uh, shameless plug, so, or or I guess a friend plug would be a better, um, a really good friend of mine is, uh, his name's Wade Billings. Uh, he's the director of engineering at Better Up. Uh, if you're familiar with Better Up, they're a, a one-on-one coaching platform. They've gotten some press because Prince Harry's on their, their board. Um, but when I took on the director of business development role here at Next Level, uh, I, I reached out to him and I was like, hey man, we already work together. So I'm not worried about like selling Better Up on using our services. We already, they're a client. I said, um, I'd love to spend some time with you unrelated to some of the roles that we're working on and uh, and just pick your brain. Uh, and he, he was like, yeah. And he spent an hour with me. And I said, look, I said, I don't be hit up by people like me on a regular basis. You know, what would make you respond to an email or to a phone call if we didn't know each other? And man, the 30 minute conversation that flowed from that question was a whole paradigm shift in the way I view my role here. And uh, I can't thank him enough. So wait, if you listen to this, thank you again. I've thanked him like three times. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, I mean, I, I think, you know, for anyone listening to this, seeking out people that are ahead of you, um, mm-hmm. that's been impactful to me privately, like in my professionally. Um, I, I don't want to know where I would be as an individual without the mentorship of others. Yes, sir. So, yeah, that's awesome. I feel that. Yeah. And then and you're reading. You know, I, I love that uh, you are actually reading because I was like, man, we didn't pre-plan this podcast. And you said, you know, got some books. And I'm glad when I said what books you were able to answer. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't a trap. But when I asked, I thought, oof. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me tell you how Lord of the Rings relates to product. I could probably spend a yard, but I'm not sure that would have uh, landed awesome. quite as well. That's awesome, man. We can really chase rabbits on that one. Um, do you do you like Lord of the Rings? Oh yeah, I've got a copy of the Silmarillion back here. You know, I've got I go down that Tolkien wormhole, but yeah, most of what you're seeing back here um, is not business related. It's a lot of yeah. sci-fi, fantasy. Um, you know, I like the old school golden era sci-fi dudes. So a lot of Heinlein, a lot of um, Bradbury, a lot of yeah. Asimov. So there's you know that's the influence of my folks. Um, they kind of said, you know, we don't care what you're reading, but you're sure as hell going to read a lot. Yeah. And uh, I've got some books on the shelf that are certainly older than myself, and they're among the most treasured things, even if they were 50 cents off a, you know, a corner bookstore back when they were originally published. Those are good parents, man. Yes, sir. I um, think so. Do you think Amazon is going to um, improve the Lord of the Rings world? Or um, how do you, are you boy, I, I've been... I've been trying to stay away from it. You know, I like to be surprised when a yeah. new show hits the books. Um, so I'm of two minds of these things, as one often is. Uh, I grew up reading the Wheel of Time series. So Robert Jordan, yeah. eventually finished by uh, Brandon Sanderson. Great series. Loved it. Loved it. 
Um, the Amazon didn't do it justice, in my opinion, because they're trimming a couple of storylines that I found personally resonant, especially because I was, you know, 8, 10, 12 years old when I first yeah. read them. But watching it with my wife and seeing I could have never convinced her to take on, hey, here's 13 books averaging 800 pages. Why don't you dive in? But Mass. hey, with, yes, but with an Amazon show, like she's digging it, you know, it gives us something to talk about, gives us something to watch. Um, I bet you after another season or two, I can probably convince her to pick up a book. So in that sense, it's hard for me to be such a uh, elitist about having read the books yeah. back in the day when it wasn't cool. You know what? Uh, gates open. Come on in, friends. Like, yeah. you know, if, if even another thousand people who had never read The Lord of the Rings um, get pick it up because of the Amazon show, I'm going to ignore the trolls. They're saying, oh, it's not perfect based on this, this, and this description. Yeah, you're right. It's not. I don't care. My kids love the show and they got them into the book. I'm good. Yeah. Ben, if you have the Silmarillion, you really are a Tolkien fan. Oh, not only is it uh, Silmarillion, I've got two copies, one of which is the Illustrated. And so, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Let's, now we're getting into truly nerdy territory. Yeah, like, no, I'm fine with it. I'm good. I'm good with it. You know, <laughs> he made up an entire language for I Middle know. Earth. Right? I mean, this, really, this, yeah. the dude is so really. iconic. Like, uh, you, you talk about a, um, uh, boy, whatever the archi uh, the architecture term for that, the keystone, I think it is, the, the stone that puts both yes. sides of the bridge together so that they don't collapse. Tolkien is the keystone to everything that's happened in fantasy storytelling, yes. sci-fi storytelling. Like, you have to defend when you depart from, like, his viewpoint of fairies or orcs or this um, uh, idea of, you know, the uh, the trees of light. You see that carried through in some weird things. I'm, you know, this is going to sound odd, trying to relate Silmarillion to My Little Pony. But, <laughs> but, but stay, stay with me, Wes. So my daughter's watching My Little Pony. She's three and a half years old. And the opening sequence is about this magical pony that was connected to the sun and the evil magical pony that was connected to the moon and how they're fighting with each other. And like, boy, this is very similar to the Iluvatar um, description of the tree of light and the tree of night. I'm just like, boy, Tolkien is influencing my little pony in my mind now. Yeah. I, I'm, it, I can't escape the dude. He's just too iconic. Yeah, no, I mean, to your point, it, he was the pioneer for fan fantasy literature. Oh, like I mean, was. in my view, obviously, you know, it's maybe not my generation. I had the fortune of coming into everyone who grew up with him. But when I look at like um, George R. R. Martin, you know, when he was coming out of Northwestern yep. um, grad school, journalism school, if I recall, and was writing all these short stories for Nebula and those uh, great magazines and publications of that day. Even at that era, you could tell the next generation, the next two or three generations were just so the, the the gravity well of Tolkien was so intense that there was yeah. no avoiding him. You might make a parallel crazy version of him, but you either had to defend why you were departing from him or just lean into that skid. Yeah, the idea that there's this gravity well of um, influence that, I mean, I, I love seeing all these new space pictures about how the um, James Webb telescope is being able to express how light actually bends around gravity. I, I feel like that's how every piece of fantasy literature since Tolkien, um, original J.R.R. and Christopher Tolkien more recently, um, has been able to produce this content that is just so iconic and so deep and so ingrained with the thematic elements from religions and pagan mythology and all these great myths and storytelling from every yeah. culture. It's just, I dig it. And I could just go on and on and on about it if you let me. Maybe that's, maybe that's the next podcast. Yeah, no, I, I could. Um, I know, you know, related to that, have you ever read any of C.S. Lewis's space works on oh, space? Oh, yes, sir. Nice. What do you, what, what are, how do you think that compares to like Lord of the Rings? Because him and Tolkien, uh, they, they were fans. I mean, they were friends, right? I mean, yeah. talk about birds know, of a feather walking together. I mean, they were yeah, tight. Sir, it's like trying to talk about Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett without mentioning one or the other. The only thing I can say is I wish we had gotten a C.S. Lewis Tolkien collab. I don't know if it would have yes. been quite the peanut butter and jelly that we had with Gaiman and Pratchett. But, uh, you know, just the fact that this this is, I, I'm going to keep trying to keep us grounded a little bit to product and the idea of I'm not grounded people at all. who are doing it. Yeah, I know, but I, I'm going to make an honest effort at it. The idea that you have contemporaries that are you respect and you can borrow from and steal from and embrace what they've, um, the, the trail they've blazed, 
that's just cool to me. Like, and that is the key of like, you can't be so wrapped up in your own brilliance that you think I can do this by myself. Maybe if you're Tolkien and you're one out of the million, but even him, you can see the influences, the people he drew inspiration from and what he actively chose not to do. A good mentor might give you just enough to tell you this is what worked and this is what didn't. Right. You might want to take that to heart and avoid this part right. that didn't. And um, authors, uh, you know, flycasters, anyone who's dealing with that knowledge that has been built up through experience, through um, the opportunity to fail, through the opportunity yeah. to uh, only partially succeed, you know, that, that's gold, man. And I'm sure folks who are trying to break into this in, you know, 22, 24, 26 years old, I would have been impatient then. But if you just let it happen, you let it develop, you give yourself an opportunity to learn from these smart, hardworking, dumb people around you and just take away what you can, good or bad. Man, that's all I can say is observational reality is going to be more important than um, anything that you're going to be able to just dream up yourself. Right. No, that's good. That's good. And, you know, you, you mentioned a couple of times job hopping. I, I don't view, you know, I've looked at your background. I don't, I don't think that's job hopping. I think that you and I are similar in that the moves that I have made haven't been because I was unhappy at X and man, maybe I can find happiness at Y company. It's been like, I believe this move is going to induce growth in me professionally. Right. Now I, I, I determined a, a few years ago that if I was considering a, a job offer, and I'd weighed all the all the options, the pros and the cons. And at the end of the day, the only reason to not take it was fear induced or because of fear. Then that was a good reason to take it. That was my logic. Like if the only reason is fear, I should probably take the role. Um, and so, man, that's that's what I've done. And it looks like that's kind of what you've done. I mean, a, a life of purpose and design with a lot of luck sprinkled through is going to be something that um, pays dividends. So it took me a couple of years to figure out like Salesforce or this business application technology area was where I had the most opportunity and the most uh, impact. And then it took me a little bit more to figure out like, boy, I've gotten real, real deep in a couple of very specific businesses like ad tech. You know, it, it didn't have the breadth of experience that I needed to land a role like I did. So yes, um, I did. I don't think I've uh, stayed less than 14 or 15 months. So I've always stayed at least a year, proved that I could do the job, proved that right. they would have kept me if they uh, could have kept me. But at the same time, I looked and understood that, okay, this is what I was missing at this job and would have helped me accelerate. So I'm going to go work for that bare bones startup and just have to do everything. And boy, yeah. now that I've worked at a bare bones startup, I realized I haven't seen enough board. So I'm going to go be a consultant. I'm going to see 30 different applications because then boy, I can't have that legacy continuity of my uh, delivery and my um, ability to influence a large org. And if I go to you know, a two or 4,000 person company, I'll know how to do that. And now that I've done all these things, I'm ready to go back to those smaller startups and have the impact that I wanted to have three or four years ago. You know, um, I, I live in Denver because I want to fish and I want to snowboard. It's not, I didn't end up here accidentally. Don't end up in a job accidentally. Don't just take it because it sounded good and you got a little bit more money. Take it because, yeah. boy, this is going to give me experience in XYZ. I'm going to learn all these new clouds. I'm going to be the idiot who's in charge of something that's only half a step smarter than anyone else in, uh, doing that. But I'm the one who's ultimately responsible if something goes wrong. And then that's going, those dogs nipping at your heels are going to kind of keep you moving and keep you learning and um, put you in that situation where if something like, a rattle because I was a rattle pilot tester. Um, they, I, I gave them a couple feedback points. Um, when I was on their trial, I built something that happened to catch the eye of the CTO and they were able to roll out to some other customers. But I, I they found out I was leaving the company and they just swooped in and grabbed me. Like yeah. I wasn't, when I submitted my letter of resignation for my previous org, I wasn't headed to rattle. I was headed someplace else. And then rattle found out through whatever channel they found out and said, boy, before you start, as long as you're making a transition anyway, let us come in and pitch you. And it was that, again, huge, huge healthy dose of luck, but a lot of opportunistic 
uh, boy, I was going to say exploitation. I can't think of a better word. But there was a lot of opportunistic decision making on my part where I took, you know, an opportunity to learn more. And, you know, I always left the org better than I found it, but they certainly wanted more out of me. And every time I left, but I knew that there was something I was missing, something I could get someplace else that I couldn't get there. And I took that opportunity, bet on the, that eventually paying dividends. And that's kind of why I'm in product right now is, yeah, maybe I do go back to business technology, but it will have, you know, knowing what goes into product development. And maybe I stay on the product side, knowing deeply what all those IT business integration, business systems and engineering. Now I'm a more well-rounded person that could approach uh, executive or maybe even a C-suite type of role with a deeper understanding of not only this is how you develop internal systems, but this is how you build a, a tool that can be customized to whatever the individual needs without you putting too many of your pre uh, preconceptions about what it has to be. Because that's been my big struggle is for so long, I was just building something perfect for my org. And now I have to build right. something that's very good for everyone's org. And that's a tough <laughs> mindset change to kind of get into. Right. And, and get the various feedback because I, what I would imagine is already um, as a product leader, people want different things, right? Yes, sir. And being able to break it down and say, they're talking about a very hyper specific business process. But if I take it a little bit higher level and said, we're looking for this event to update this record and trigger something else and notify this person. There's ways to distill it just enough and then give them enough tools that they can customize it to meet their needs that we can hopefully get to a uh, something that is a little bit more universally helpful because I got very, very good at solving my problems, but learning how to, how do I say this? Um, I'm learning how to make a cool Lego set that everyone else can play with instead of just building a cool Lego set following my own inspiration and instructions. And it's um, probably the part I've struggled with most so far. I'm sure I'll run into other problems as seniority and time advances, but that's the one that whenever I'm going to my mentors and asking for coaching help, that's the one I'm looking for a little bit advisement on is how do I transition my mindset from solving a hyper-specific problem to listening real closely about what my customers are telling me and kind of grouping them together and figuring out how I can give them just enough to do what they need to do while not minimizing what another someone who's going to follow them might want to do um, that's slightly different. And that's, that's hard, but it's fun and it's exciting. Yeah, it is. It is. And working at a small, a small company that, that is growing yeah, is fun, right? I, I think so. I would never, in the same way, I think Denver's fun. Like I'll never begrudge someone that says, no, I don't want to live in Denver. The, you get skin cancer because there's no altitude and it's hard to breathe. Like, yeah, those are valid points. If you don't like working at a startup, I'm not going to tell you it's the place to go. But yeah, I dig it. I think yeah. it's a cool place to be. I'll, I've been in the corporate world and uh, now I'm going to, you know, there's, uh, when I started here, there were four or five of us. There's 30 of us and there'll be 50 of us by the end of the year. And man, I, I prefer it a lot over the Fortune 500 company I used to work at. I just put it to you that way. It's a, it's a lot more fun. James, I want I want to be respectful of, of your time, man. So Two final questions. Um, if you could talk to someone who was five years behind you in their career, what advice would you give them? And then after you gave them that advice, what bourbon would you recommend to them? <laughs> All right. Well, the easy question first, advice. So never underestimate the value. So the advice I would give someone five years ago, and this is true for any student of year. You could be five years, 10 years older than me. Don't discount the opportunity to learn from folks who have already done something similar. And don't be afraid to, as long as they aren't the ones that have the power to uh, fire you or shuffle you out of the org, ask some really dumb questions. You know, ask for help wherever you can, ask for guidance, and do so in a space where you feel confident that you can lay bare any concerns or, in, or deficiencies you feel like you have. Because if you aren't self-aware enough to recognize that, what you don't know and if you go in just thinking that you're the king the killer and have all the answers 
growth, you might be right at the moment, but growth is going to stall out. So don't be afraid to look dumb in the situation where it won't impact you too much professionally and really, really work on curating that network. Because if I had only focused on folks in the Salesforce ecosystem that would help me be a better Salesforce person, I would not have the product management uh, mentors that I'm now relying on so heavily to reach out to. So talk to your sales leaders, talk to your marketing leaders, understand everything that's going into a business because you may get that just can't miss opportunity that you will be just too afraid to take if you don't have someone to lean on. And that may be someone that you only had a coffee with who was a sales manager five years ago and who's now an EVP or CRO of sales. And that person will be the one that because they remember that you bought them a coffee, you asked them some nice questions and you connected on something personally, um, that will be a great way to just uh, assuage any of the concerns you have about imposter syndrome or whatever may come up with that. So that's the easy part of the question because um, it's vague. Meet people, learn stuff, um, try hard. But I love it. Meet people and learn stuff. There you go, man. Yeah, hey, hey. Yeah. I mean, and uh, don't discount luck, but be grateful when luck comes up. Don't get too uh, big for your britches. You know, recognize, uh, was it the Greeks or the Romans who said, remember, thou art mortal? Uh, remember, yeah. luck can turn on you. So um, take it when you got it, but be humble when you take it. So since you have a deep understanding of whiskey roa I've, I've got to bring the heat when it comes to uh, a bourbon that i would recommend so i'm going to discount the rye folks i, I love a good um Sakale rye but that's for marylanders and folks in the northeast so bourbon 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 if i was going to recommend one that i would say someone coming to colorado should take a crack at so just in case this podcast went sideways i had this near at hand this is a single barrel hand printed through 31 to 58, but they do this every year. 291 Colorado Bourbon Whiskey. It has won 2018 nice. Double Gold, World Spirits Competition, uh, Sip Awards, all sorts of good stuff. I will say it's great on ice. It's great straight up with a tiny bit of water. And if you have the makings for a proper old fashioned, no simple syrup, my friend. You got to have the right yes. uh, confectioner's sugar so you don't get anything grainy. But if you can, build, if you have the skill to do a proper old fashioned, this is my jam. And I can't, you nice. know what? I'll send you one bottle if you'll send me something from uh, your neck of the woods. Done. That's a deal. Seriously, that's a deal. We'll do it. And maybe, maybe we can get a random sponsorship for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that would be next podcast. Well, about bourbon. Drunkenly drinking whiskey and talking about the Silmarillion and My Little Pony. I am, I am here for that. Done. Done. Yeah. Well, we're, we're definitely going to do a follow on. I can't wait. I'll, I can't wait um, to get this posted. So, James, I'm going to leave you to your day. I've really enjoyed it. And um, if I didn't feel selfish. Uh, I'd keep going for like another hour, but I know that you have things to do. Well, Wes, always a pleasure. Good luck with everything going on this week and say hello to the family at home. I know that they probably miss you on the days you end up at the office. They do. I, we live out, I, I think I told you this before, we live out in the middle of nowhere, man. So I know. It's, uh, it's, it's a like, commute for you. Yeah. It's it's like an event for me to come into the office. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. say hi to the new hires and much love to all the folks at Next Level. It was always a pleasure talking to y'all. Yeah. You as well, James. Have a good day, man. Talk soon. Next day. Next day.